<clears throat> they're going to go to gold. And in order to do that, uh, I'm afraid it's going to have to be at a much higher gold price. And I hate to say that with gold at 2,500, frankly. And it's treated me very well over the years. But I think it's going to wind up treating us better because in the past, people bought gold out of prudence. They bought it for safety. But in the future, it's it's going to be out of fear and out of panic. And that's absolutely going to include foreign central banks who own a lot of dollars and are going to dump them. For what? Uh, gold is the only alternative, actually. Welcome back to Metals and Miners. I'm its founder and its host, Gary Bohm. Today, we have a fantastic discussion lined up, and we're fortunate to have with us Doug Casey. Doug is the founder and chairman of Casey Research. He's a contrarian, a speculator, and highly successful metals and mining investor for more than five decades. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Gary. So the jobs data just revised total employment down by 818,000 jobs. This on the heels of downward jobs revisions in 13 of the last 15 months. The consumer debt is exploding, and so is their inability to pay their debt on time. Savings is at a low that it hasn't been seen in generations. Corporate bankruptcies are rising to levels not seen since the 2008 great financial crisis. And the university of Michigan sentiment index is at its lowest recorded reading going back to 1952. Yet restaurants, movie theaters, and vacation spots, they're all still filled up. There seems to be a disconnect going on. In your analysis, what's the real state of the consumer and the economy right now? And what do you think happens next? Well, to start with, government figures. Uh, the figures in the U.S., uh, are untrustworthy. I don't trust them much more than I trust the figures that, uh, until recently, have come out of the Argentine government. Uh, so that's the first thing. But uh, that is a shocking revision, 800,000 people. You ask how they could be that wrong. But um, on the other hand, I kind of expect it, because for years I've been saying that we – are embarking upon a period of time that I believe someday will be called the Greater Depression. And I call it the Greater Depression because it's going to be much longer lasting uh, and much different uh, and much more severe than the unpleasantness of 1929 to 1946. So uh, this is part of a an emerging trend. It's been building for some years, and it's going to reach a climax. Things are going to get quite unpleasant uh, in the U.S., I'm afraid, over this decade. So, Doug, the, the Fed appears to be pivoting at a time when the stock market is at all-time highs. Market valuations are at 200% of GDP. Home prices are at their all-time highs and are largely unaffordable for the median income earner. Government deficits, they're blowing out, especially in the U.S., where there's no hope to figure out prop, proper tax and spend policy to even rein it in. The Fed has never lowered rates in this type of environment. What does your analysis point to in terms of outcomes for the economy and markets with the Fed lowering rates in this environment? Well, let me preface my answer by saying the Fed should be abolished. It never should have been created. Uh, in 1913, it's uh, interest rates are perhaps the most single price in the economy. They certainly shouldn't be set by a bunch of politically motivated bureaucrats who, insof insofar as they understand economics at all, only understand Keynesian economics, which is um, uh, these people are essentially political apologist. An economist is someone who describes the way the world works. Uh, these people are trying to prescribe the way they think the world ought to work and manipulate the fates of not just 300 million people in this country, but 
uh, billions of people around the world uh, by uh, playing around with the value of the dollar. So what are they going to do? Uh, well, it's unpredictable, uh, quite frankly. Uh, but there's really nothing they can do at this point because whether the economy does well or poorly, uh, creating more money can't help it. If creating a bunch of money and playing with interest rates could help it, then Zimbabwe should have been a roaring success, uh, or for that matter, Argentina. Although I hate to mention Argentina, the country where I live, uh, some months of the year because it's changed radically in the last few months. But uh, no, the the Fed is an engine of destruction, and I I don't try to second guess what these people do. They're really just bureaucrats that are way too full of themselves and have way too much power. So like I had mentioned in the question, markets are, you know, at 200% of GDP in terms of valuations, the uh, home prices are at all time highs. At some point in the near future, are you expecting some widespread deleveraging event in the marketplace to take place? Yeah. Deleveraging. Uh, if we have deleveraging, I fear that it will take place as a deflationary credit collapse. In other words, there is so much debt in the world uh, today, and debt has been smart because uh, smart on the part of borrowers, because uh, uh, the dollar is obviously a rapidly depreciating asset. But um, there is so much debt in the world uh, on every level. Uh, from student debt to mortgage debt, credit card debt, uh, automobile debt, uh, government debt, corporate debt, uh, that uh, it could easily be defaulted on. And if defaults start, uh, it could be a daisy chain, where since everybody's indebted, one person can't pay the next person can't pay. The next person can't pay. So it's an innately unstable situation today that we're dealing with. Uh, and it's going to end badly. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we could have a credit collapse. On the other hand, uh, if the Fed uh, keeps trying to prop up the rotting structure by printing more money, we could have something that... Uh, resembles a runaway inflation. Uh, but either way, it's bad economic news. So that's a tale of two extremes, and they're trying to uh, walk a tightrope in between is what it sounds like. <laughs> well, they're completely incompetent in doing so. So, Doug, the, one of the problems, one of the big problems we had today is that most central bankers, particularly the U.S. Federal Reserve, they don't act in ways that enforce any discipline on government spending. We have record budget deficits with no end in sight on top of an exploding national debt that's impossible to pay back. The result is ever-expanding debt servicing that continues to harm our budget and essentially puts us in this debt doom loop that forces more debt issuance just to pay off the debt we have. What are the consequences for bonds, interest rates, and inflation moving forward? Well, your description is quite accurate, Gary. Uh, as far as bonds are concerned, uh, that is one asset class that uh, I don't want to own. I'm willing to speculate in bonds from time to time. Uh, I'll even buy a bond if it's a convertible bond from a company I like, and especially I like the underlying company, but that's an anomaly. Uh, frankly, uh, bonds uh, should be avoided today at all costs. They're a triple threat to your capital. You have the currency risk, and the fate of the dollar is grim. Uh, you've got the interest rate risk. Uh, I think that interest rates are bound to head up with inflation. Uh, they're likely to head up to the levels of the early 1980s when most people don't realize or remember that 
even the U.S. government was paying 15 to 20 percent for uh, current money. Mm -hmm. So you've got the uh, and then the third thing is you've got the default risk. Now, the U.S. government doesn't have to worry about that. They can just print up money mm -hmm. uh, aided by the Federal Reserve, of course. Uh, but uh, ordinary debtors can easily default. So there are triple threat to your capital. You don't want to own bonds uh, or, or really uh, any kind of debt today. Uh, it's a very unstable world we live in at the moment. So inflation, I heard you mention inflation. So you're expecting inflation to return and return pretty strongly? Yeah, because inflation, <clears throat> see, th th this is another thing that I don't think people understand, certainly not the people that are running for office this year. Uh, it's not the fault of the butcher, or the beggar, or the oil maker. Uh, it's exclusively the fault of the people that control the currency, the people that print up Federal Reserve notes, the people that are in a position to expand credit. Uh, that's just said the Federal Reserve and actually commercial banks, which are all also very unsound uh, and are indirectly creatures of the government today, too. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, staying on the topic of currency debasement, does it matter who wins the upcoming presidential election? Are we going to get a lot more uh, currency debasement regardless of who wins? Uh, I'm afraid we will, uh, because don't forget that right now uh, the government is running $2 trillion annual deficits. Uh, now, how do, they, how do you finance that. Uh, uh, the Chinese and the Japanese uh, foreigners aren't buying U.S. government debt anymore. In fact, they're unloading it. Uh, they saw what happened to the Russians, uh, and uh, they know what can happen to anybody. Um, so uh, where's this $2 trillion going to come from? Uh, it's when the government runs a deficit, there's only one real buyer for it today. That's the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve buys the debt from the government and credits the U.S. government with dollars at commercial banks where the government can then spend the money. Uh, that process is going to continue uh, until the uh, system blows up. But wait a minute. Have I gone off? Have I gone off uh, you're off fine. The top a little bit no, you're fine. You're fine. Did you want to okay. add anything else there? No. Okay. I, oh, I guess the question is, uh, uh, does it make any difference whether the uh, Republicans or the Democrats win? And yes, I'd say it does, but not from a monetary point of view, really. Uh, one thing that you can expect is that the Democrats uh, who actively and overtly want to increase the size of the government, will do their best to tax and spend and inflate. So they're really very, very dangerous. Uh, the Republicans are almost equally dangerous. There's not much they can do unless they bring the entire rotten structure down at this point. But uh, at least they don't overtly and actively want to uh, uh, print dollars quite as badly. But they but, but both of these parties, neither of which have any understanding of economics, they're both trapped. So, Doug, inflation has recently hit its highest level since the 70s. As governments worldwide, they're debasing their fiat currencies at breakneck, breakneck speed. The cost of living is soaring, and it's likely to worsen. Kamala Harris, who's running for president of the United States, recently came out in support of price controls. In this environment, is it typical for opportunists in government to implement price controls as a misguided solution? And do you think we're actually going to see them soon? And what are the dangers of price controls? Yeah, I think there's an excellent chance we will, because uh, governments notoriously don't control themselves. They try to control their subjects. And uh, Pamela, who is being installed as the head of the evil party, uh, uh, she's unintelligent, 
She is unknowledgeable. She has bad moral character. It, it, it's like a trifecta of uh, the things you want for a, a really bad leader. So, uh, and I'm afraid that the Democrats are going to win in uh, November. Uh, I, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, uh, first of all, the Democrats and Kamala will promise a lot more to voters, and voters want something for nothing because they're even more ignorant than the politicians are. So that's that's going to draw a lot of votes towards uh, towards Kamala. But most important, the Democrats are much more expert and competent at cheating. So that's about the only thing that they really are competent at. But they will. So this is an excellent chance that the uh, uh, Democrats will win. And uh, uh, the problems that we have today will be compounded at an even higher rate uh, than if the Republicans win. What are some of the ramifications of price controls? What, what would we start to see happening? Well, shortages. I mean, look, you can price control the price of gasoline to a dollar a gallon, no, 50 cents a gallon. And uh, you can have all the gas that you want at that price, but it won't exist because it cannot be produced at that price. So it's, uh, uh, they'll do that as a stop. And, and of course, they won't blame it on their own stupidity. They'll blame it on the greedy oil companies. And the same for the greedy beef producers and the greedy home builders and, 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 and so forth. Uh, I ask themselves why they do these things, because throughout recorded history, uh, well, I think the first instance that we have of price controls, famous instance, were uh, Diocletian's price controls uh, about the year 300 in the uh, collapsing Roman Empire. Uh, they created a disaster and, and added to a, a massive change, uh, accelerating the collapse of Roman society. But these people don't read history. They don't even read history of, of what uh, Nixon did when he put on price controls 50 years ago. It was a catastrophe. But we have Kamala, who, as I said, is, is a person of low intelligence and almost no knowledge, saying that, saying that she actually likes the idea of Nixonomics. So that's, uh, the situation is actually pretty hopeless. Let's discuss the BRICS and de-dollarization. What is your analysis of the BRICS de-dollarization, which is currently happening on the margins, and their use of gold to settle their trade imbalances? Some see this as a big nothing burger, and some see this as the beginning of the end of the dollar. Where are you on this issue? Well, it's inevitable that uh, foreign countries will stop using the dollar. Uh, they realize it's a hot potato. Look, the major export of the U.S. for well over 40 years uh, has not been soybeans or Boeings or uh, IBMs or things of that nature. Our major export has been dollars. And those nice foreigners accept the dollars and send us real goods. As a consequence of that, there are tens, scores, of, nobody knows exactly, uh, of trillions of U.S. dollars that are held by foreigners. Now, unlike Americans who have to use dollars, it's the law here in the U.S., uh, they're legal tender. Foreigners use dollars strictly because they're um, convenient, they're liquid. Everybody else accepts them. But that's going to come to an end uh, when confidence which is really all that the U.S. dollar rests on, blows away. And confidence can blow away like a pile of feathers in a hurricane. And at that point, <clears throat> those tens or scores of trillions of dollars that foreigners own, they're not going to want to pass the old maid card to each other anymore, not want to hold on to the hot potato. Once again, they see what the U.S. government did to the Russians, uh, they don't want to be in that position either. So they're going to dump their dollars. But to whom? Uh, the only place you'll dump, be able to dump them to at that point is the U.S. 
where those dollars will come back to the U.S. and in, in exchange for U.S. companies, U.S. commodities, U.S. land. Uh, so with lots and lots of extra dollars coming into the country and less wealth uh, owned by Americans, uh, inflation could explode. Now, the U.S. government's not going to do nothing when this happens. They'll put on foreign exchange controls. Uh, they will include not being citizens, not being able to export more dollars. So uh, you better get your dollars out of the country now while you still can. But controls on foreigners being able to send them back to the U.S. This is going to be complete chaos, and it's inevitable. So the answer to the question is, uh, the BRICS countries overtly want to get rid of the dollar. But what are they going to use? Put together, they're not going to use rubles or yuan or that makes no sense, or Indian rupees. These are unstable pieces of paper, fiat currencies, worse than the dollar. <clears throat> they're going to go to gold. And in order to do that, uh, I'm afraid it's going to have to be at a much higher gold price. And I hate to say that with gold at 2500 frankly, because uh, I've been buying it since, well, since when? Since about $42, $43 an ounce. And I've never sold a single gold coin. I actually own quite a few of them, <laughs> quite a few at this point. And I've always viewed gold sometimes as a speculative vehicle, but always as a savings vehicle. And it's treated me very well over the years. But I think it's going to wind up treating us better because in the past, people bought gold out of prudence. They bought it for safety. But in the future, it's, it's going to be out of fear and out of panic. And that's absolutely going to include foreign central banks who own a lot of dollars and are going to dump them. For what? Uh, gold is the only alternative, actually. So that's a great segue. So, Doug, you're a contrarian and a speculator. And in the 1970s, you saw something in the markets and the economy that moved you to invest big in precious metals and miners. Will you share your story on what you saw at that time that drove you to make those investment decisions? And can you parallel anything from back then to what you're seeing now in today's economic and market setup? Well, what got me interested in gold to start with? Um, I was a coin collector as a little kid. A lot of kids were coin collectors then. Coins had actual value. They were made out of silver. Uh, they no longer are. Um, I'm not sure if most people even understand that. In fact, pennies aren't even made out of copper anymore. They're made out of zinc. So it, it, it's all a fraud anyway. Uh, a little bit of background, but <clears throat> I uh, was always interested in money and economics. And I read Henry Hazlitt's book, uh, Economics in One Lesson. It's a short book, but totally brilliant. Everybody should read it. Uh, kind of explains the way the world works. Then I read Harry Brown's book, uh, How to Profit from the Coming Devaluation. He wrote that book in 1970, and it very accurately predicted what happened after uh, Nixon devalued the dollar for the first time, or second time Roosevelt did it for the first time, in 1971. And uh, having read those two books, I said, this is absolutely right. And I didn't have much money back then at all, but I started buying gold and silver and uh, got involved in gold stocks as well. So... That's how I uh, first got into it, by educating myself, something which uh, people should do today. Are you seeing parallels um, from that explosive time frame for gold, silver, and the miners to what's starting to develop today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that right now uh, the opportunity is as great as it was then because the the financial situation, the economic situation, both are much more unstable than they were 50 years ago. So that when things come unglued, and they could have come unglued back then, 
uh, it's going to be much more serious. So uh, the parallels are are important and and they're great. And the U.S. government, like all governments around the world, the U.S. government is much more powerful than it was back then. It's not actually powerful, but it's much more grasping. It controls a greater amount of the economy. There are many more laws. It's printing up lots more money. So, yeah, the opportunity for that reason is at least as great as it was back in 1971. And the returns were spectacular uh, through the 70s. So it's clear that gold is being reinserted back into the multipolar currency world to provide discipline to the financial system for all the reasons you were just talking about. You also mentioned that you fear that it's starting at 2500 you think it's going to you know elevate create a floor under the prices and, and elevate gold pretty high what are the ramifications to gold supply with um central banks utilizing gold to settle uh trading you know on these larger scales well they don't want to use dollars uh which as i said dollars are hot potatoes. They're uh, things that they don't want to hold, certainly not as reserves. Uh, what can they use? Gold. So most of the central banks in the world are going to wind up accumulating more gold. I think that's where most of the gold buying is coming from. It's these central banks, which have a real problem, uh, not being able to use dollars uh, as reserves not wanting to use dollars to trade, to settle things with each other. Because remember, <clears throat> the dollar uh, clears through the SWIFT system. And that means that when Russia buys something from China, well, or India buys something from, from Russia or Indonesia or whoever, it settles through New York. Uh, and this makes no sense from their point of view to use their adversaries, possible enemies, currency. So that's why it's coming to an end, and that's why the world is going to actually go back to gold. Now, I hope it goes back to gold on a retail level so that uh, individuals can use it. And, of course, you go to China, and there are thousands, thousands of gold shops all over China, and the Chinese government, believe it or not, actually encourages the Chinese people to buy gold. It's easy to do in China at uh, very little markup. Uh, but uh, the main buyer is are these governments themselves. I, I hope that uh, we can once again have gold coins in our pocket uh, and use them for day-to-day -day commerce. But certainly governments will use use it for settling between each other. So do you see do you see the addition, this large addition of the BRICS utilizing gold to settle? Do you see that pinching supply in any way? Um, or you just see the price responding? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, first of all, how much gold is there in the world? Uh, we talk about supply and demand. But nobody knows how much gold is actually above ground. Uh, I'd say the best guess is about 7 billion ounces, which is less than one ounce for every person on the planet. Uh, and the amount of gold in the world, supply-wise, is increasing at 90 to 100 million ounces per year. So uh, the amount of gold in the world is increasing at about... Uh, one and a half percent per year at most, one and a third percent per year at most, something on that order. Um, and I wouldn't worry about the supply side because it's all a question of the price. I mean, when we talk about Bitcoin, for instance, we don't worry about the supply side because the supply side is totally fixed. 21, 21 million Bitcoin, and it can't be more than that. And, of course, uh, when it comes to gold, uh, most of the low-hanging fruit has been picked uh, throughout 5,000 years of history with people 
trying to mine it. But on the other hand, uh, technology is, has advanced a pace. And it used to be in Roman times, the Romans couldn't profitably mine gold for, if it was less than a half an ounce per ton, maybe more like an ounce per ton, only really high grade deposits. Uh, now we can mine gold at a half a gram per ton uh, profitably. And uh, of course, uh, when you mine copper or, uh, well, mainly copper, uh, gold is often a byproduct. So I, I'm not worried about the supply side of, of gold. And the demand side is going to take care of itself. So, Doug, in July 2007, the Fed began to cut rates and gold jumped from about $675 to about $1,000 in March of 2008. In March of 2008, major cracks in the financial system began to expose themselves as Bear Stearns collapsed. At that point, everything started to plunge, including gold, which fell almost 30%, but it never fell below that price, that 675 price that it was at when the Fed first began to cut rates back in July of 2007. And then after it hit the bottom, which was higher than 675, it was like 700 or so. It was then off to the races. What does the, the movement by gold back then tell you from all that circumstance? And what are you expecting for the movements of gold this time around? I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It is free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and every single expert interview that we conduct, just like this one. They're all up there. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, You Know Neither History Nor Economics. This free gift is a must-read for everyone on why we all should own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive the free gift on us. Also, I'm positive that you've enjoyed the conversation with Doug as much as I have. Please let him know. Hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment below the video.